We're all going to be hearing that music all night long, aren't we? <laughs> Earworms. They're real. They're real. Enjoy it. It's nice and soft and welcoming. Speaking of that, we have a conversation coming up about how the United Kingdom and the United States are major trade and economic partners and how this relationship could be defining for transatlantic trade partnerships for the future. So this afternoon, please welcome to this stage Loretta Boniti, host of In Focus with Loretta Boniti, the senior political reporter at Spectrum One News, and Kunal Khatri, Deputy Trade Commissioner for North America from the United Kingdom Department for Business and Trade. Welcome. Thank you. Good. Okay, well, as a quick little introduction to, to what we're going to be talking about, uh, obviously the United Kingdom is a major trade and economic partner with the United States. So when we talk about this transatlantic partnership, we want to talk about maybe some of the areas where there's opportunity for, for collaboration, new collaboration even on mm -hmm. things like clean energy and critical technologies. Um, to help answer these questions, we'll jo join by Colonel Khatri. He is the Deputy Trade Commissioner for North America, United Kingdom Department of Business and Trade. This is a little bit of a long bio here, but I think that this is an important bio. He's responsible for leading the cross-country team to deliver new trade and investment opportunities across all economic sectors by helping the UK firms export to and enter into the market and support US firms to invest in the UK. Uh, he's come, prior to this, he was based in Beijing, uh, the, the embassy. He's worked at the World Bank, the United Nations, and the Economist newspaper. Obviously, he's bringing with him some global financial expertise. Thank you so much of course, thank you. For, for joining us. I, I, I want to start with this because earlier in June when uh, the Prime Minister uh, visited the White House. The United States and the United Kingdom announced the Atlantic Declaration for a 21st Century U.S.-U.K. Economic Partnership. So let's kind of start broad here. Can you break down a little bit for us what's the framework of this and maybe how it could strengthen some commercial activity? Absolutely, yeah. So <clears throat> thank you for that introduction and it's delighted to be here. Um, this is my first visit to North Carolina. Um, Welcome. And it's been fantastic. So I, we'll, we'll kick off on the Atlantic Declaration and just the bigger context to that and why we did that and what it means. The, the obvious starting point is the UK and US are two of the most important strategic partners, economically, militarily, polit politically. Uh, if you look at the trade and investment flows, there's about one and a half trillion dollars invested in each other's country. There's about one million people across the US, 40,000 here in North Carolina who go to work for British businesses. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So the Atlantic Declaration was, well, how do you build and manifest on top of that? And in particular, the parallel we were trying to draw was, if you look at the US-UK defense and military relationship, it is decades deep. And lots of examples of military joint tactical operations. You've got Ukraine, where UK and US have been at the very forefront of that. Um, and it was a bit of a message, well, how do you replicate that on the economic sphere? In a world where security dynamics are shifting, not just from military to geopolitical and to economic. So the Atlantic Declaration was, how can we amplify and reinforce the relationship to deliver across the economic security challenge? Key pillars to that are emerging technologies, quantum AI, biotech. We've just had the AI Safety Summit in the UK. Vice President Harris was there. That really helped convene 28 countries to commit to joint collaboration on AI safety. The same for energy, renewable technologies. So we are in negotiations on critical minerals with the US. Data transformation, digital trade. We've just signed a US-UK data bridge. And then, you know, the same goes across health uh, and space and, and other sectors as well. So that's what it's trying to do, trying to amplify our economic relationship and how do you actually leverage the full force of government to build on what we already have. You, you mentioned the AI summit. When, when this uh, partnership was announced, the, the White House qualified this as that it's going to help the United States and the United Kingdom in our efforts to harness energy transition and technological breakthroughs to drive broadly shared growth, create jobs, and leave no community behind. Mm. You mentioned this artificial intelligence summit that the Prime Minister just yeah. hosted last week. How important is it for folks? We have leaders from around the world 
at that and tech leaders yeah, all, yeah. also at that to kind of be on the same page in this emerging technology. Yeah, it is a big challenge. And uh, previous speakers spoke about Elon Musk. So he was there. He did a fireside <laughs> yeah. chat with the prime minister and in very Musk style said everybody's <laughs> going to be out of a job uh, sure. quite soon. <laughs> But I, I think what is remarkable about that summit, and also what the White House have been doing through their executive orders, is that convening mechanism to being, bring industry and policy together to think in advance of what are the implications and impact of artificial intelligence. So the key things that we announced were a safety institute in the UK, the US is going to do the same, to actually test these algos and these models before they're released. There was also an announcement to almost replicate what the IPCC does for climate and have a science report to actually give us the state of industry and say what those risks are. And it's very obvious that the approach that we universally, governments are taking in response to AI is so utterly different to early 2000s, late 90s and the explosion of internet. Mm -hmm. And you know, being behind the curve, frankly, on the explosion of social media and all these internet giants, this is an attempt to actually get ahead of the curve and think, okay, how do we collaborate to actually effectively regulate whilst allowing the innovative impetus from these technologies? When we're looking at this partnership, especially between our, our, our two countries, is, is this tech part of this really important towards this partnership? I think tech is critical. Um, it's probably the most critical pillar of what we define as economic security. So as you said, I, I was in China for five years before coming out here. Um, and it's very, it's difficult to overestimate just the amount of investment and focus in China on technology, advanced technologies. And that has been a catalyst and a stimulus for US, UK, European powers to think, okay, where are we vulnerable? What are our dependencies? What are our resiliency? And what is it that we need to do to um, insulate from that, but ensure that we're also building the bedrock for future tech power? So the previous panel was talking about a car with 220 chips, mm -hmm. you know, reliant on Taiwan. And I think the actions the US are taking, UK and others, to try and build those fabs here, bring TSMC over to Arizona, but also try and bring public capital into semiconductors or quantum or biotech or future telecoms such that we can have resiliency at home is absolutely critical to safeguarding economic security coupled with future prosperity. You know, we look at this partnership and we look at the broad aspect uh, of this, but you also have memorandums of understandings mm -hmm. with individual states here through, throughout the country, Utah, Washington, Indiana, South Carolina, Oklahoma, and of course, of course. Here, <laughs> here in North Carolina. Uh, how do these state level MOUs play into the partnership? Yeah, so, so we've signed six, North Carolina was the second. Uh, and I'm not saying it's just because I'm here, I think it's been one of the most fruitful. Um, the impetus for that was we were really keen to try and build deeper economic trade investment relationships at state level, not just at a federal level. So we did have a history of FTA negotiations on the previous administration. We've been very clear that like, we stand ready to you know, pick those up again. I think we had four rounds, but the appetite's not necessarily there, but we want to do a deep trade relationship, trade agreement when the moment comes. In parallel, though, there is much more you can do at a state level. My, a big part of my job is promoting the different cities and the landing zones to UK business. Mm -hmm. And if your UK business is coming to the US, we're very starry eyed, it's a big market. If you crack the US, you crack essentially the largest market for, you, for UK goods and services. But the problem is we, we, as UK corporate, very narrowly focus on the big cities, New York, Boston, San Francisco. And it doesn't make sense for a lot of companies. It doesn't make sense for product fit, for their readiness, and also for the support that you can actually get from cities and states. And it was just obvious to us that there are enormous opportunities across the U US. And these MOUs are meant to be built as a platform for us to unlock those relationships. Relationships with Stephen and the economic development agencies, with local corporates, local investors, and actually bring companies here. And you know, we've had successes. So Marshall Aerospace were one. They've invested 50 million in new engineering facilities here. There are already a large number of UK companies here as well. So we're trying to build that platform to deepen relationships here. And I thought very interesting in the previous panel, just the hundreds of thousands of people who moved to North Carolina. I was in Atlanta yesterday, I'll be in Florida next week. It's a similar story across a lot of the southern states. Very large, very fast growing. We want to try and take advantage of that. And companies are coming here, but North Carolina is also sending companies over yeah. to the United Kingdom, Epic Games, right. S SPX, DYs. So th this is, we're seeing jobs yeah. being created on both sides of this equation. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's part of what we're trying to do, attract that inward investment into the UK. Those companies you listed are great examples. Um, some of them are invested in Manchester and the mayor of Manchester came out 
to North Carolina, um, which I thought was fantastic. It really adds flesh to the bones of the MOU. What is the point? And also, because I grew up in Manchester and spending time in Raleigh and you know, the Triangle, it's a very similar story and a very similar look and a feel to the cities. Manchester went through its cotton and industrial and manufacturing boom. Mm -hmm. Then it went through a trough, uh, you know, my younger days, but it's totally rebounded as a life sciences, uh, advanced research, manufacturing and creatives kind of hub. And you see that across a lot of cities across the US, that rebirth. Mm -hmm. Um, and a very similar feel to the city, so I hope there's more to come in that space. Do you see this, these MOUs? The, is this going to continue to grow? Is this the path that you see towards this partnership? Yeah, that's right. So we have a number in the pipeline. Um, so we will be signing more, hopefully, in the very near future, and this will continue. Um, the, the key element to the MOUs is we, we want them to be more than political pieces of paper, that there's the photo moment. So it really has to be followed by the delivery and follow through. So here we've had offshore wind delegations. We've had a working group, um, as I mentioned, Mayor of Manchester. We're trying to bring industrial delegations. And tomorrow we're hosting a procurement roundtable with officials from North Carolina, where actually I feel is a big opportunity for UK firms. But the visibility and knowledge of how to actually access procurement isn't there. But by virtue of an MOU, we can convene. We can bring it together. When the partnership was announced by the White House and the United Kingdom earlier this summer, it was talked about that the global economy is undergoing one of its greatest transformations since the Industrial Revolution. First of all, do you, do you agree with that when, you, when you're looking at the global economy? And how can this alliance help with that? That's a big question for the this remaining. That's a big question. Um, we have seven minutes yeah, left. <laughs> I, I do agree this is a very profound um, shift in global economy. We have this thing called the Integrated Review, which sets out our vision of you know, the UK and the world. And we refer to this period as the epochal challenge, and especially China's rise. Uh, pandemic on top of that to catalyze that. And I think that's playing out in different areas. One is economic and industrial strategy. So we've seen much more interventionism across the globe. And here in the US, you have the Infrastructure Bill, you have the Inflation Reduction Act, your CHIPS Act. Yeah. It's mirrored in the EU with a significant relaxation of state aid rules. Uh, and China's been doing it for a long time. And I've seen firsthand in different countries the powers and the pitfalls of that kind of approach. You can't deny the massive economic success China has had, lifting 800 million out of poverty. But it wasn't just industrial intervention. It was significant opening of the economy. And leaving it aside the politics of WTO success and you know, compliance, it was opening a market reform of the Chinese economy that really helped catalyze growth. And I think that's a critical pillar uh, in the period we're in to avoid the risk of protectionism. Intervention is fine, industrial strategy, fine. You know, incentivizing investing in business, fine. But we've got to remember that it's the free and open market, market dynamics that have catalyzed so much growth and that's critical to sustain as well. Uh we talk about free and open markets. When we look towards the future, obviously there's politics involved with, with everything and elections involved with everything, but are, are we moving any closer towards a US-UK free trade agreement? So we've been saying for a while that we are ready to negotiate a deep and comprehensive FTA when the administration is ready to do so. Um, I think it's no secret that you know, an FTA has not been top of the list for the administration. But we have been doing a huge amount despite that. And I think there's a general realization consensus that FTAs are not the only way to deepen a trade and investment relationship. So I mentioned some aspects. We've got the UK-US data bridge. Mm -hmm. We are negotiating a critical minerals agreement. Um, one of the biggest successes early in the administration was resolving the Section 232 tariffs on steel. It just removed a real difficult point in the relationship. We've got access for lamb, we've removed tariff on scotch whiskies. There's so much more that can happen outside of FTAs, and then including at the state level as well. So we're ready to do it, but um, it's not the only way to deepening the relationship. You've mentioned the critical min minerals in two of your answers here. Mm. T talk to me a little bit about what, what's happening with that. Yeah, so I think it goes to your question about are we in a profound change and what does the future look like? And there's such a deep awareness that critical minerals, whether it's, you know, lithium, cobalt, et cetera, are absolutely essential to the future of our net zero transitions, renewable technologies, you know, if you're looking at semiconductors or the compute power for AI and then for quantum. And with that, a realization of where our dependencies are and where our vulnerabilities are. So the, the critical minerals agreement is actually part of, and it flows out of the um, Inflation Reduction Act. And in particular, it's ensuring an accessibility of UK firms to the subsidies and incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act. Because that goes back to the point of, you can have industrial and interventionist policy, 
but it shouldn't be protectionist and at the expense of, in particular, the allies that we're seeking to work with. We, we hear so much talk about, you, you mentioned renewables, so much talk about the clean energy sector and as we're moving forward with that. How much do, do our countries work together as, as we move into this future? Mm -hmm. We do a lot together across all industries. So my, that's the bread and butter of my team across the US and Canada. Um, we cover all sectors from creative media sports to renewable energy to defense and to technology. So it, it is really front and center what we're trying to do to bring companies in both directions, but also develop partnerships. The previous speaker was talking about the, the VC model and your know, investments made in those sectors. One area of growing work is we have something called the, N, the National Strategic Security Investment Fund, NSIF. The US has very long standing something called Incutel in DC. And they are seeded by you know, administration defense uh, departments to invest in critical emerging technologies which have an applicability and deployability into military. So we've been supporting delegation of our NSIF, the Incutel equivalent, out to market to meet with VCs, meet with investors, meet with Incutel, because that to me feels like a very obvious bridge that we can build to actually even co-invest at some point, co-invest in these emerging technologies. And I would love to see more happening in that space. So, so obviously there's so many things that folks are working together on, moving forward, you have these MOUs. Are there challenges right now to broadening even further? I think, I wouldn't say there's necessarily challenges, but the universal challenge for a UK business entering into the US is, and this is a merit of the US market, it is intensely competitive. And it, you have to be very, very fully prepared to enter this market, including boots on the ground, and fully investing the capital and the time to make it a success. This goes back to the point of trying to help UK businesses understand that um, Raleigh, Kerry might be the place, Durham might be the place for you, not New York City. Mm -hmm. So you have to get that right. I think at a more macroeconomic level, the strategic challenge that we face as a UK and a lot of other nations face is with the degree of incentives and capital on the table from something like the Inflation Reduction Act, how is it that we work with the grain of that to support UK business, but at the same time avoid the risk of any protectionist barriers but also drawing uh, business and company and, and jobs away from the UK as well. And that is very top of mind in the discussions that we have with the administration. How do we actually work together to jointly develop economic jobs, prosperity, security for the future, mm -hmm. uh, not one at the expense of the other? In, in, in both directions. In both directions, so you, yeah. Bringing more jobs and companies also to the UK. That's right, that's right, yeah. Because, um, you know, ultimately that's the bread and butter. We've both, you know, US, UK and here in North Carolina, and back home across our cities, trying to bring jobs and prosperity uh, to home. And that's another element of the big transformation in macroeconomic policy is this appreciation realization that free trade open markets uh, have been very good for GDP at a macro level and economic progress. But we know that within societies, there have been enormous disparities, enormous inequality and wealth gaps. So there has to be a pivot to ensure that we are creating jobs for everyone and in creating jobs and opportunities for those that are in industries that are going to be hit and left behind brings us back to AI and that previous conversation. How is it you're going to support, reskill, or compensate or provide a welfare net for those who are going to be hit by future tech change? As we get ready to cl close this out, I mean, in general, do you see big changes coming soon or is this going to con be incremental as we see these changes? I think, you know, there's always a cycle that um, we as government certainly slow to see what's coming on the horizon, then it comes, AI's exploded, chat GPT's available, and then 110% all in to try and figure out what the solution is. And then we'll come back to a steady state. I think if you take AI as an example, we're, we're in that peak, coming back to a steady state to then map out what the path is forward. Um, so I think there are elements such as AI which will be a quicker impact than anything we've seen before. Mm -hmm. The next phase will be quantum, and once that quantum moment comes, I'll be even quicker as well. So it is going to be an increasing challenges for bureaucracies, governments in particular, to stay ahead of that curve. A lot for us to pay attention mm -hmm. to. Thank you so much for joining no, thank us you. today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sharing all of this information. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>